Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Tejeda, and I'm with the Monterey Bay Salmon and Trout Project. You're going to be hanging out with me for about like six virtual photo, uh, photo walks where we'll be actually uh, taking a journey starting from here at Boulder Creek, California. We're actually here at Boulder Creek next to the San Lorenzo River. We'll be starting here and then working our way down to the uh, beach boardwalk where we'll be discussing salmon and trout and their life cycle along the way. Well, you might be wondering, actually, like, what is a salmon? Well, that's a good question. But a salmon is a fish species, a specific type of fish species. And like, when you think about fish species, you might think about them just kind of hanging out in the water. You see, these salmon are what we call anadromous. Now, not all of them are anadromous. Some are landlocked, like sockeye at Lake Tahoe. You might be uh, familiar with them. They just go back and forth Taylor Creek to Lake Tahoe. But here, in like the coast of California on the San Lorenzo River, these uh, fish, these anadromous fish, salmon, are born here in the creek in fresh water. They migrate on towards the estuary, which is brackish water, and then go on into the ocean, okay? So they're different. They've adapted and evolved through about 150,000 years to be able to do this. So, so you should have been seeing a coho salmon at that time. But now, I want to show you what a male salmon looks like. And we call a male salmon a buck. All right, so this one right here is a male, and we can tell the male by its pronounced hook jaw. And so if you look real closely there, you can see that it's not this like soft jaw, it's a very hook jaw, okay? And so, and right next to that, and the next photo coming up is its mate, which is a female coho salmon. And the reason why we're talking about coho salmon is because that's what was once very abundant here, as, as well as the steelhead, which we'll be talking about. So right now you should be looking at a female coho salmon, and you can tell the difference between the two. This one's uh, jaw is less pronounced, has a beautiful stripe running across its side, and it doesn't have that vibrant red like, like the male does. And, but it may eventually turn that color, it can. And so uh, this is a female, which we call a hen. A male is called a buck, and a female is called a hen. Now, so the next photo is of their cousin, the steelhead rainbow trout. Now, you might be familiar with rainbow trout, and you might be thinking, well, I know rainbow trout, Mr. Richard. They're the ones that hang out in the creek all the time and stuff. And I caught one before with my uncle or something, or maybe I caught one at fishing in the city, or, you know, who knows? Well, these are just a little bit different, right? So we have resident rainbow trout, which hang out in the river their whole entire life. But some of them are special rainbow trout, known as steelhead rainbow trout. And they're genetically encoded. And those ones are genetically encoded to say, hey, you have to go to the ocean. You're going to migrate back and forth, right? And so, um, so that's how that works. What's very interesting is two rainbow trout can make a steelhead rainbow trout. Two steelhead uh, male and female can make a rainbow trout. Or one rainbow trout, one steelhead can make a steelhead. And so it's very, very confusing. And we necessarily don't know exactly what makes that happen, okay? But maybe you kids can figure that out one day. Okay? And so I do want to orient you to where we were at. So the moderator, by the way, is John. Uh, Butterill and he's from Canada and he's going to pull up a, a map right now and that map is going to show you of the uh, San Lorenzo watershed and it has a star at where we're located and then I made a blow up map so that you can get in a little closer and get a better idea of where we're at today along our uh, uh, trip of six virtual photo walks or virtual field trips um, we'll be placing a star so that you can see where we've been and where we're going okay and so uh, we are at Boulder Creek, California. This is the beautiful and miraculous and infamous Santa Cruz Mountains, which a lot of us take for granted. And this is the beautiful Boulder Creek right behind me, coming uh, from like Big Basin, Redwood State Park. And then shortly we'll show you what's behind us, and that is the San Lorenzo River. And right now there's a bunch of people actually playing and have a good time here. So that is pretty cool. So that map, just take a second to go ahead and look at that. Um, and you're seeing that uh, this watershed actually begins at a place that I used to work at. And that is Castle Rock State Park. And Kings Creek is part of the upper watershed. And we're seeing that Kings Creek and other creeks uh, and rain um, and aquifers and uh, little creeks uh, and things like that uh, creates a bigger river. Oh, kids, I'll tell you right now, a, a watershed is not a shed full of water. I'm sorry the both I'm used to, right? But if you go ahead and put your hands like this, 
we can kind of imagine what a watershed is, right? So if we were outside right now, if it was raining, and we put our hands out, all of the rain would kind of hit our fingertips, run down our fingers, and collect where, right? So think of your fingers in those little lines. Uh, think of your fingertips as mountains catching the rain. Think of the lines as creeks. And think of your palm as a place where it gathers, okay? And so a watershed is an area. And when we talk about watershed boundaries, if you could just think about the outline of your fingertips and those mountains. That's what is a boundary of a watershed. And when it rains somewhere else, or if there's another watershed, then all that water is going to collect somewhere else. And some place you might be familiar with is something like the Guadalupe River watershed, where the water goes into uh, El Viso and the San Francisco Bay. But this is much different, where the San Lorenzo River is on the opposite side of the Guadalupe watershed, but this water is going down into Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and directly into the Pacific Ocean. So that's an example of two uh, border watersheds next to each other and how they drain into two different systems, okay? Um, again, just wanted to let you know that this uh, is like a, a tributary, what we call a tributary, and the water is actually coming from uh, springs and aquifers, and so if you've ever kind of taken a walk along the creek and seen kind of water coming out of the side of a bank, like maybe this one here, um, that's from pressure and the aquifer being so uh, saturated with water and, and pressure pushing that water up through the crevices or cracks in a, in a mountain and pushing that water out. And it comes out into a creek, okay? And, and so uh, we were here just last week and the water was a lot higher. Uh, and Meg pointed out today that when we were here today, the water did drop a good foot. And that's because we haven't had that of rainwater. And so rainwater is a big uh, contributor to our rivers and creeks. And we'll be talking about that in drought and how summer affects dry in one of our later segments. So uh, uh, back to anadromous really quick. Just wanted to let you know um, that anadromous again, want to reiterate that anadromous species begin in freshwater as eggs, okay? They're born, turn into fry and elevin. Smolt, when they're smolt, they're going to make their way down. Uh, we just did a smolt release at, uh, at the Fisher Flats King Hatchery with uh, Ben Harris and the NOAA uh, biologist, where the smolts, we released them into uh, Big Creek Hatchery, Big Creek, excuse me. They'll be going to the Scott Creek and then migrating out to the Pacific Ocean. Okay? And so in this case, these fish on the San Lorenzo are going to uh, stop next to uh, the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk before going into. Uh, salt water and they have to stop to acclimate okay and you might be able to just to think about what might happen to a fish if it goes directly from fresh water to salt having two-way communication here we're doing this through zoom and we're able to take questions and so um, what are some reasons salmon might move from river to the ocean and back again so if anybody uh, thinks that they know anybody in the audience think that they know why uh, uh, an anadromous fish might migrate or might need to migrate uh, from fresh water to the ocean. Does anybody want to uh, raise their hand or maybe uh, put it in the chat? We'll take a second. You could unmute yourself and you can just speak directly to me. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Just like we said, you know, Meg said that this dropped about a foot, and so it's gonna to continue to get lower and lower. Right now, we're barely in May, but we still have June, July, and August. And through that time, this water's gonna to continue to get lower. So about 150,000 years ago, who knows? Uh, that could have been the evolutionary thing uh, that uh, happened, was that these fish were smart enough to understand that, hey, in the summer, there's not much water here. So we gotta figure something out. And they figure something out indeed. And that is to be anadromous and the ability to change psychologically and physiologically to be able to adapt from fresh water to salt water. Now, let me grab my little puppet real quick and see if it's in here. You got a problem with my puppet? You got a problem with my puppet? So, what happens, this is actually a sockeye, right? This is not the one from my it's sockeye. But what happens, kids, is, is if you have a salmon or a trout and it's working their way down the river in fresh water, if they don't have an area to stop in, such as an estuary, they're gonna move straight from fresh water right into salt water, and guess what, kids? They're gonna be like this. 
So they need to stop in that area, okay? And we'll be talking about that more in later segments. So adaptation. So uh, the uh, ocean is full of food, uh, better survival. There's a lot of stuff in there though. They get really big, really small, really big. And then they could be able to migrate back and forth from uh, when the water was low and wait until the fall when the water's high and come back in, okay? So they're pretty smart. Fish are really smart actually. Why do they come up the stream? Well, they come up the stream to spawn, to lay eggs. And so um, that's what, you know, like we'll talk about like what a birds build when they want to have babies, well, they build nests. Well, fish build what's called a red bed uh, with, with two Bs though, uh, like the color red, but with two Bs. And so uh, really quick, what we're gonna do is talk about uh, why and where a fish might look for a location to spawn. So when a female comes into an area, she may be looking for an ideal area to spawn. And that would uh, include a well-shaded area so that the water is cool. So what we're gonna do is, here at the Monterey Bay Salmon Trial Project, we're really scientific and we're really into some cool stuff. And so this is one of our uh, read uh, monitors that reads conductivity and sal salinity and stuff. Did, that, did we pass that one? I think that's coming up. Yeah, that one's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw this probe in and it's gonna tell me the water temperature. And we're going to come back to that. That's important because later in the program, we're going to look at our uh, uh, salmon trout education program hatch chart from the curriculum, and we're going to determine how many days is it going to take for these eggs that are currently in here to hatch, okay? And we can tell that by water temperature, okay? And so we're going to check it out. Right now it's about 53 deg degrees, but I think it might be uh, a little colder. And so what makes a good lo location for spawning? Back to that. Well, if I was a fish, I would love to hang out right here because we have all of this wonderful rock and substrate here known as river rock or noyo rock. And salmon and trout prefer fist sized rock. And we'll talk about that when we build a red bed in a short second here, okay? But there's lots of vegetation here. There's lots of rock. There's flowing water, which provides dissolved oxygen. There's a canopy, which provides a habitat uh, for terrestrial creatures like macroinvertebrates, which are aquatic creatures, like stoneflies, mayflies, dragonflies. They all live in the water, and eventually they're going to have a complete metamorphosism or an incomplete metamorphosism and crawl out into this terrestrial area and use these trees and habitat, okay, as habitat. And so, what makes an ideal location? Look around. This is it, right here. Blowing water, clear water, cool and clean, lots of shade, and it's a great place to be a fish. The water temperature is 53 degrees. All right. And so, the reason why it's so important, boys and girls, if you didn't know, and ladies and gentlemen, or why it's so important to have cool water and shade is that because uh, the cooler the water, the more dissolved oxygen it can hold for a fish. Now, me and you, we breathe uh, through our lungs. We breathe oxygen. But if you look behind me here and you see this white water, that white water is actually water that's hitting a rock and it's actually grabbing water from uh, uh, oxygen from the atmosphere and bringing it back down, right? And so this is an ideal location for a, 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 a salmon or trout to hang out in. Lots of dissolved oxygen, right? And so they breathe just like you and I. They lo love dissolved oxygen. If, it's, if the water gets warmer, there'll be less dissolved oxygen. And if there's pollution in the water, there'll be less dissolved oxygen because the dissolved oxygen is what breaks down the pollution, okay? So just like we like oxygen, Fish love dissolved oxygen, and just like we'll die without oxygen, fish can die without dissolved oxygen, okay? So, yeah. So you guys want to build a red bed? All right, let's do it. So right now what we're going to do is we are going to uh, move the tripod location over to this area where it's sunny with all this different gravel. We're going to build a red bed and simulate uh, how that works, okay? I'll meet you over there.
uh, the picture to give them the canopy shot of what the uh, canopy looks like over this way. Above you here. We are a, like a salmon. We're coming down to the water. And we're thinking, well, you know, I think that this is a cool location to build a red bed. And remember kids, when fish want, uh, when birds want to have babies, they build what's called a nest. We all know that. But when we, but when we, if you're a fish, you build what's called a red bed. And it's made out of rock, okay? So uh, Elijah's going to go ahead and uh, pinch to zoom. He's going to zoom in so that you can see kind of my hands, okay? Now, in this creek, it's a very beautiful creek, very clear, um, where it doesn't seem like there's much pollution. And we have different types of rock uh, substrate here, right? So I'm just going to grab a few different sizes for you to see. And and so when we look at the, uh, these different types of substrate, uh, th there are different sizes, okay? And now you might say, well, what's up with these things? These are like uh, abiotic. These are non-living things. How can a rock be so important to a, a species? Well, let's talk about it and let's figure it out, right? So when the fish comes into this area, uh, one of the things that she's going to do is not necessarily move the rocks like I do, but she's going to find an ideal location and she's going to come in and she's going to swim in, right? Because this is this way, this way. The water's coming down this way. Fish don't like to be this way because the water needs to go through their gill filaments. They need to open their mouth up and the water goes in and it goes through the gill filaments and that's how they uh, get the dissolved oxygen. So if the fish is backwards, yeah, they can do it and all, but it's not the best thing. So this fish is coming in. This fish swims into this red bed area, and she's going to lay on her side, and she's going to slap that tail. And she's going to continue on, and she might come back. So she might swim back around, and she's going to come back around this way, and she's going to slap that air, uh, fin again. And what she's doing is, she's cleaning out the silt and the sediment that is in the water, right? And you can see it. But so eventually what she's doing is uh, removing that silt and digging a hole. And eventually that hole is going to start to look like something. It's going to be a, uh, eventually start to take form. And now we see that we have some sort of little circular type of nest. Okay, now why is this so important? Well, let's look that when we have some fish eggs, and we just put the fish eggs in the water, say that the trout and the salmon, they weren't so smart, and they just said, hey, I'm just gonna lay some eggs right here. Well, what do you think's gonna happen to those eggs when we get a big storm? When we get a big storm, those eggs are going to get washed away. When a great egret, a great blue heron such as this one, snowy egret, fish or whatever it may be they come in and they could easily eat those eggs right off the top right so that's a bad thing but what if the fish cleaned out this nest you ever watch prices right kids no you haven't remember the game planko no you don't there's a lot of people watching to do so you get your little egg and the thing is is that when you drop it in the nest there's little interstitial spaces Interstitial spaces. Now, not all of them are going to go into the interstitial spaces, but now we've had all these eggs, and now when the great blue heron comes, they're not on top. Some are going to be so down below that they're not going to be able to get them. So, this is going to increase their survival rate, right? So, they build a nest, and it's a place where they the eggs are protected, okay? So they can uh, lay eggs about 500 to 1,000, and it's what I like to say, don't put all your eggs in one basket, because what if that one basket gets in an accident or something? Then all your eggs are gone. And so in this case, they'll build multiple red beds and deposit 1,000 eggs in each one, for example, in case there's a landslide, uh, in case there's predators, um, you know, out of the four nests, maybe one nest will make it, okay? And so, um, we should have seen a, an indentation of a, a red bed, which they saw, right, and the eggs that were in there, okay? 
Uh, so that was photo six. Uh, what to do if you see a red in the river? Well, you can report it to uh, the Monterey Bay Salmon Trout Project. You can report it to NOAA, or you can report it to Park Fish and Wildlife. You can report it to NOAA, the no uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they have fisheries biologists. What you don't want to do is walk through it. You don't want to mess with it, and you don't want to scare the fish away from that protecting that red bed. So basically, just like you would do with a nest, keep your hands off of it pretty much, and just leave it alone. You could observe from a safe distance, but know that uh, fish are very skittish, and they can uh, they can ab abandon the red bed, uh, which can then become susceptible to, a, to predators if there's too many people around. All right, let's show let's show some predators real quick. And so uh, the great blue heron is just an example of one. Uh, but there's also mammals like raccoons who have opposable thumbs and they'll come right into the water and they'll just start fishing at night catching little uh, little ele or not elements, if anything maybe elements but more fry and they'll catch them and just pop them right into their mouths and then we have predatory fish uh, like uh, striped bass and so if you look at that great blue heron you know look at that spear that that the this thing it curls up like an S, their neck, and then it, it, it strikes like a spear. And that fish got speared right through his body, which is pretty amazing uh, um, um, how powerful that spear is. And then the raccoons, they'll come out at night uh, and they'll just, uh, they'll fish with their hands. And so some mammal predators. Everybody likes raccoons. They need to eat too, so it's just part of an ecosystem. So now you're seeing how, how uh, a salmon and trout provide uh, as a food web, right? They're not just here hanging out. They're part of the team too. Okay. Now there's a video that uh, is going to be in your uh, Google Classroom, if anything, and that's going to be a link to salmon carcass study, okay? And why that's so important is that um, we're, we're still on the striped bass photo, that's fine. Okay. All right. Okay. So, really quick, um, if you didn't know, uh, humans are what we call R-type species, and fish are what we call K-type species. Now, is, is we still on the still on the, on the striper? No, okay, good. Now, um, there's a reason though. So, if humans have like one, two, three type babies, and fish have you know thousands of eggs, uh, does anybody want to chime in? Why do you think? fish have need to have thousands of eggs. Anybody want to answer that question? All right, well, it is due to survival rate, right? So humans, we have a high survival rate. We only have one, two babies. You know, if we're lucky, we have triplets and we, we get drilled and crazy, right? But, uh, but fish are our type species, frogs are our type species. They have thousands of eggs because they have a very low survival rate and that is due to uh, temperature, drought, uh, raccoons, predators, humans, uh, just so, so many things, right? And so uh, that is the difference. One of the things that I do want to show you is uh, our egg to fry display, which are kind of uh, rare to come by these days. Uh, but I'll come up to the camera, and what we're seeing here are the actual eggs. Now, clear eggs are unfertile. They will not hatch. But the eye eggs are fertile. Now these, these are no longer alive kids, but these are used for educational purposes. And so these are the clear eggs, not fertile. They will not hatch. Here are the eye, eye eggs, and those are black dots, or the eyes looking back at you. And then when they uh, hatch, they're known as elevin, and they have that yo little yolk sac there, okay? We might get into that in a second. And then eventually, they're gonna turn into what's called a fry. So, and so this is the beginning of the life cycle of them and so this is how uh, real size of what they might look like and these are pacific salmon chinook salmon uh, egg types here okay the rainbow trout the steelhead egg types are, are, are about half the size actually They're smaller perfect so yeah so uh john's pulling up slide 10 and then we'll see that after they start to change right so the egg the egg is laid it hatches and it's starting to go through different stages of DNA. It's turning into a little fish. Okay. So, right. how many times do fish spawn? All right, so that's a great question, man. You know, um, is that 
uh, salmon are known as uh, semiloparous. They only spawn one time and they pass away. And we're going to talk about what happens when they pass away. Um, but steelhead are what's known as enteroparous. And they can spawn up, up to five times from what I hear. And so meaning that uh, the steelhead can, uh, rainbow trout can come in, uh, lay eggs, and then uh, out migrate back to the ocean, regain its strength, and then come back and lay eggs and go back and forth. The salmon, like the Chinook salmon uh, and other type species, dog chum, or that might be the same thing, actually, um, they uh, are only able to spawn one time and then they pass away. Um, and so in that, that's where we get to that Google Classroom uh, salmon carcass study where they're grabbing the carcasses and throwing them in the forest so that they can produce uh, fertilizer. It's in, okay? our, it's in our folder of student home activities. Yeah, it's in the folder of student home activities, I say. Nice. Um, and so when these uh, eggs are, are hatched, and you might say, well, where do they live? Miss Richards, like they just hatched and now they're so tiny, they're, they're this little yolk sack thing. And you're right, they're like so vulnerable. Like I like to say they have this basketball around their stomach and it's hard to swim with a fish as a fish with a basketball on their stomach, right? And so what these little fish are gonna do is as soon as they hatch, they're gonna stay in the rock. They're gonna stay in the noil rock, the interstitial spaces. And why do you think they do that? Their mouth is so tiny they can't eat. What is that yolk sac for? That's their food reserve for the next 30 to 45 days. They don't need to eat anything, and if they, their mouth's too small to eat any macrobiotics. And so they're gonna hide in the interstitial spaces, and they're gonna hang out there until they absorb that yolk sac, and they're able to now swim in the column and start to eat little, little insects. Let's pull, let's pull up a photo of a elephant, which is uh, number 12. Then we'll go back to the hash chart if we need to. All right, number 12. So there's an elephant. That's what they look like. There's their yolk sac. Uh, lots of cool veins. These uh, photos are from um, uh, Elko Jones, who's given us permission to use these for environmental education. He's a wonderful photographer. It really gives you uh, some insight. And all the species that we're looking at today are coho salmon, except for the still that we see. Uh, so those are uh, coho salmon elephant, uh, which is very fitting for uh, this area, which was once abundant in coho salmon. So how long does it take eggs to hatch? Alright, well let's look. So our temperature says, uh, John, go ahead and pull up uh, number 11, photo 11, which is the uh, when will they hatch chart. So it says, our temperature, Meg, is 53 degrees. Well, how many days for people, viewers, kids, anybody? How many days is it going to take our eggs to hatch if we're at 53 degrees right now? Go ahead and look at that chart Wait. and go ahead and raise your hand or just put it in chat or call out. How many days is it going to take? 24 to 31. Yes, like 24 to 31, exactly, right? And so we took the temperature and that's how uh, we get a general idea. And so why is it so important to have cool water? Why would it be bad to have warm water? And what's gonna make that water nice and cool? This riparian corridor right here. The riparian corridor is all the good. green vegetation that you see running along the banks and streams, right? It's this, uh, this uh, white elder. We have uh, oak. We have redwoods. Um, we have uh, some types of native grasses here. And there's lots of vegetation here, maybe out of that. Yeah. And so uh, that's going to shade this water and keep it nice and cool, and they love that. Where do they swim? Where might they swim? Yeah. Like the little fry? Can you show us? Yeah, I'm going to show you that. Okay. So in here, when we talk about habitat, I'm going to grab this for them. We're going to come right in here, okay? So when we look in here, uh, we're gonna see that we have a, a type of habitat, okay? And if we look in here, you see that we have, we have water. Indeed we do. You will not see an adult in here. You may for a short period of time, but adults are not gonna hang in here. 
because the water's too shallow, water's too clear, they'll get picked off by birds and stuff. But this is an ideal place for the little fry to hang out, and they might hang out, why would you say? They might hang out somewhere. If you were a fish, where would you hang out? Would you hang out right here in the middle? Or would you hang out under this undercut, this natural bank here that's not made of cement? that goes back, if you put your hand in there, it probably goes back a good two feet. So that's probably where you would want to hang out. We have this pool of water that's over here. And now, if anything, that's where you're going to find some, some, some bigger fish. So let's go over to this spot where I'm just going to show you a little bit of this, uh, of this habitat, of where we're at. Uh, we will be ending with the video. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, perfect. So let me just... Okay, I'm going to take you guys for... I believe we're going to do 50 minutes today because of the classroom. But I'm going to come this way. I'm just going to take you guys just to see some of this geology, okay? So this is where we were at here. We look up, we see these beautiful redwoods, these alders. What we call the overstory and the understory that makes up the riparian corridor. Along the way, there's uh, California blackberry. We're hearing lots of birds, so there's definitely lots of birds here. Um, if we come here, we have uh, people here too. There's some nice geology over there. There's just some people just enjoying the beautiful San Lorenzo River. We have to remember that, you know, it's uh, for salmon and trout. It's also for humans. And there's a there's a um, a healthy balance between the two, right? And then we come over here, we see this area over here where it looks like there's kind of some sand. It's from the, uh, it's from the sediment and it's from the erosion. So it's almost like beach-like right here. You see some uh, big leaf maple along the way. And I'm just gonna set this up so you can see exactly where, so it's gonna set you up right here. Okay, so right here uh, we have, coming this way is the San Lorenzo River. And then we were just right here. And so coming down this way is where the uh, Boulder Creek comes in. So San Lorenzo, this book, and, and we call that a tributary, okay? A tributary. Um, and tributaries uh, have numbers. I think this would be number one, uh, uh, Boulder Creek. And then a tributary from Boulder Creek would be number two. And then a tributary from uh, that would be number three and, and, and so on and so on. If you come over here, just want to show them some of the willows. and trip on that log there. And so, for example, we have this beautiful willow and we have these beautiful catkins. And these catkins are the reproductive part of this willow. So a lot of willows, uh, red willow, a royal willow, uh, different types of willows. And these are, these are water-loving uh, trees, if anything. Willows are kind of shrubby though. And then we come over here and we see a beautiful uh, maple, like a big leaf maple. Uh, that is in here. We also see some some alder. So it might be a white alder here. And then we have some type of, of maple below. Okay. And then over here we have a great example of some habitat uh, where we have a ripple and then that ripple is going to turn into a pool. So come on over this way. So not too deep. It gets a little louder. We're seeing where that dissolved oxygen is picking up. Over here, it's real stagnant. People love to swim, uh, but the fish don't like this area probably because the water's not moving so good. But over here, if there's a fish, the fish will be hanging down at the bottom, just breathing in all of that uh, dissolved oxygen and waiting for insects to float down so that they can gobble them up, okay? Uh, at our next session, we're gonna get really uh, scientific. We're gonna be busting out some uh, microscopes, some equipment, and some magnifiers, tweezers and things like that. We're gonna be looking for macroinvertebrates. This place is loaded with aquatic insects. We have about five minutes left, so let me just show you a couple before we take off, okay? So you're, you're not gonna be able to see these too closely until our next session. But if we see right here, it looks like a, a stone fly, and we can see it moving around. But if I put water on it, it'll move around more. Let me try it. There it is. See, it's moving. So this is an aquatic insect. It's a macroinvertebrate. Fish don't eat McDonald's, boys and girls. They eat macroinvertebrates. And this is a stone fly. And eventually, the stone fly is going to uh, metamorphosize and it's going to fly away. So like the, you might be familiar with the dragonfly. Well, not a lot of people realize the dragonflies only live like one, one week in the water. 
I mean, excuse me, one week out of the water. And so when they're flying, they can die in midair. And so uh, fish do eat uh, dragonfly larva. Uh, that might have been something. Might have been a the beginning of a caddisfly home. Let's see what else we have on some rocks. Might be a caddisfly home. And so uh, next week's gonna be great. We'll bring some trays out. These, uh, these little things are homes as well, okay? So sometimes we'll knock on the home and see if anybody comes out, right? But most likely that's a caddisfly home. And then on this rock, oh, look at that. Nice. Yeah, go ahead and start to show that video. We're gonna wrap it up. But again, just join us next for our next session. And we're gonna be talking about macular vertebrae and fry in the next stage.